Matt uh, spoke very eloquently there about um, what public art can do uh, in terms of what an artist might do. This maybe is an attempt to think about what a spectator does with public art. So um, it's not an attempt to analyze it or to take it apart or to historicize it. It's, ra it's rather an attempt to, to, to respond to it, uh, the type of thinking that it might produce. And in this context, the type of thinking is related to uh, Minty, Neil, and, uh, and Nick's work, Then and Now, which I guess you know is outside, um, just on the canal. Um, it's, it's quite a beautiful work in three ways to, do, to deal really with stones that are out there, to do with a lovely little engraving, and also to do with these quite extraordinary kind of mouldings of, of metal that are weathering. So they're all out there if you want to see them later. <clears throat> A little bit of context too. Um, the paper looks to engage in what I've called previously in an essay I wrote about walking the Paris meridian. I called it an, an ecography or an ecography, uh, which I'm really not too proud of now. But it's a way really of thinking about what might an ecological writing be. Uh, put simply, this type of writing is formed through experience uh, where a body is folded into its environment and where that body becomes open to a series of multiple and overlapping thoughts, imaginings, and maybe even becomings. If we wanted to theorize this, which maybe today we don't, we could look at it through the ideas of Gaston Bachelard, Karen Barad, and Michel Foucault. Uh, and I'm really intrigued about what it might mean to take care of an ecological self. I think that self is a self that's at odds with what we might see as the kind of phallocentric, really very kind of patriarchal logic uh, inherent in what I prefer to call capitalist modernity. The paper is also an attempt to practice uh, theatrical thinking. So it's attempting to practice theatrical thinking. Although it arises from watching theatre, theatrical thinking as I see it is not tied to the theatrical medium. Rather, theatrical thinking, for me, is a method of and for engaging with the world. It takes into account three things, at least three things. A, a sense of temporality that you can never master or control. It's always going beyond you. It's always flowing. B, the presence of a body that moves and is affected by things. And C, a mode of relating that allows the outside to enter the inside and vice versa. I don't think that this outside and this inside can ever be resolved. On the contrary, I see the inside and the outside, what I'm interested in. I see them as being in a kind of constant movement. They're never fixed in a relationship of perpetual oscillation. There is neither beginning nor end here. There is just an in-between that never settles down, a kind of movement, a type of weather thinking. And this paper is called An Exercise in Weathered Thinking and it lasts for about 25 minutes, and it's about the seasons. So January, <clears throat> January. Then and now is in a tradition, it occupies a field, primarily that of conceptual or post-minimal art that we associate with a number of land artists, Robert Smithson, Michael Heiser, Nancy Holt. But whereas much land art was concerned, like the 18th century landscape gardener, Capability Brown, in moving and disturbing the land for the sake of a perfect image, then and now is a slight work. Its mode of operation on the canal is discreet, so discreet, in fact, that you can miss it. In that respect, I think it's much closer to the work of contemporary eco or public artists, such as David Nash, such as Matt Baker and his work on stones, and also Jan Dibitz, each of whom moulds objects that can be moved, eroded, and tampered with. This is work on a human scale that paradoxically and generatively points beyond the human to the earth systems that support it. Like a John Cage piece, then now is decidedly non-heroic. It's a work that's desperate to get out of the way in order to let the world in. It's a work that reverberates rather than absorbs. Then now is stubbornly anti-theatrical. It creates a kind of small enchantment when I'm in the mood to receive it or better still, when everything I meet on my daily walk along the canal with my dog, Mally, a black, black copper spaniel from Wales, attunes me to it. 
Much of this is accidental. The sudden falling of snow, the play of light on the water, rain that makes me stop dropping the dog lead. February. February 2016 offered some respite from the endless waves of moist air and storm systems that had swamped the west coast of the UK in the winter of 2015-16. While there were days of continual rain, there were also long spells of cold, dry weather and the canal frozen places. On a cold day in mid-February, I saw a mute swan stuck in the ice by the green-painted ducat that sits next to Firhill Stadium, Partick Thistle's football ground. In order to navigate the canal when frozen, swans usually break a path through the ice with their bodies, which they then use for landing and takeoff. On this day, however, because of the sudden shift in temperature as evening approached, the thin stretch of open water had solidified again, and the swan was unable to extract itself from the ice. People stood mesmerized. Someone phoned the Royal Society for the protection of birds. Despite the change in sunlight, on my walks past then and now in late February, I couldn't see much by way of a material semiotics that heralded the coming of spring. We were in late winter, and the vegetation and animal life were naked, quiet, dormant. It felt like we were in an interstice, very much in the now of winter, still waiting for the then of spring to come. A kind of wearied impatience, the work becoming part of things, entangled in atmospherics, inhabiting its own caesura. March. According to Jane Bennett, enchantment allows for the possibility of an ethics, a type of empathy with matter. This is what she says. The experience of enchantment is an essential component of an ethical, ecologically aware life. In the mood of enchantment, we sense that we are always mixed up with the it of matter, and this it of matter shares in some of the agency we officially ascribe only to ourselves. Bennett's words, I think, provide a useful lens for investigating the effects and affects of then and now and spectators, if that's the right word to describe those members of the public walking on the canal who unexpectedly encountered the nine granite boulders that sit on both sides of the canal at the bridge at Apple Cross Street just behind us. The surfaces of these erratics have been sculpted to resemble, as if in a scale model, the nine reservoirs that feed or fed the Forth and Clyde Canal. Depending on the weather, the surfaces of the stones can either be filled with water, iced up as solid blocks, or more rarely, left completely dry, containing then only cigarette papers and faint green rings, the traces of the rain that has accumulated in them over the winter. The stones have been weathered. After only four or five months on the canal, they already show the marks of time. As I watch my fellow walkers on the canal engage with the works, I often witness a sense of perplexity and hilarity. It seemed to me they were seduced by the sculptures, trying to make sense of them, wondering about their status, caught in some desire to decipher. I saw children, adults, adolescents laughing, touching the stones, feeling the matter, being drawn in by their shape and form. They would also look at the flanks of the stone, and what they saw in etched there on the granite were the names of reservoirs, Liddy, Hillhand, Johnston, Woodend, etc. Crucially, though, there was nothing in the work to provide an obvious context for interpretation. There was only a gap or interval between signifier and signified. And what filled this gap was nothing other than what Gaston Bachelard has termed in his great book on air and dreaming, the material imagination, an imagination that is enchanted that is produced by elemental matter. If Bachelard is right in his psychoanalysis of the four elements, air, fire, water, stone, then there would appear to be some inextricable and ineradicable symbiosis between the earth and human creativity. Something then non-negotiable and atavistic, something that cannot be undone. Earth, perhaps, is a creative resource producing its own mythology engaging in a poeticized materialism. April. I was away from the canal for much of April, but what sticks in my mind is a clear blue day somewhere towards the middle of the month when I saw the stones become luminescent in the spring sunlight. They shone white like moonstones and seemed mysterious, alive, moving at a different pace, 
from the rest of the percolating world. Then now is an open air installation. It's a weather work, something that changes in time as it is buffeted, eroded and enfolded by the weather of Glasgow, by its geography of circumstance. Even though it uses the dense elemental matter of stone and iron for its form of expression, then and now is not really a work about objects. Rather, it seeks to gather the incorporeal stuff of the atmosphere around it, attuning us to the otherwise invisible play of pressure systems, temperatures, the always moving transient passage of the sky. It is a work about time, something that for Michel Serre is found in the etymology of the words temps and tiempo in French and Spanish, both of which translate as time and weather. May. The willow trees are opening now, sun, photosynthesis, leaves, green, a heron, swallows dancing through the gaps of electricity pylons, and nine new signal swans taken to the water from their nest at Rock Villa, the new home of the National Theatre of Scotland, creativity without bounds. I focus on the word now that is written on the side of the canal nearest to the building, the whiskey bomb. It is reflecting its opposite, an upside down one on the calm surface of the water. I also know that there is an engraved then on the underside of the canal, beneath my feet, invisible to me. There is in this play of light and reflection, this temple assemblage, something intriguing. The work makes me see that the present is never quite here, but always on its way elsewhere, an impossible trace. The work's inability to put the present, the work's ability to put the present in crisis, to redistribute it, is what makes then and now so ultimately theatrical. For theatre is a medium that never stands still, a machine that places the performer in two spaces, the here of the body, the there of the character or persona. The present, of course, is caught in this fugitive space, lost in a shimmering movement, never quite here, never quite there. The always changing surface of the water makes it a perfect medium for then and now's theatrical meditation on time its commitment to the present participle. June. Much ecological thought today is seduced by what has been called neo-materialism, a type of materialism that stresses the living agency of matter. The logic at work and its attentiveness to the molecular, to the organic, is what is ordinarily left out of our discussions of the world. And its point is to descend to the human, to show that we are just one actant amongst others. Then and now is part of that debate, it draws our attention to the effective power of materials to create thought, to produce imaginings, maybe even existential territories. However, the work, whether consciously or not, does something else too. In its invitation to think the split between then and now, it cannot help but bring to mind a very different form of materialism, a kind of historical materialism, a Marxism, that is often forgotten by the proponents of neo-materialism. For to be here on the canal, severed from the present, to find oneself transported between past and future, between the ghost and the phantom. The ghosts are everywhere, absent reservoirs, dammed up rivers, broken bodies, dead things, pollution, industrialism, slavery, the machine, the clock, work, schedules, insane metabolisms, empire. And yet so too are the phantoms, rising sea levels, ice melts, global warming, mass extinction events, people movements, water wars, the heat, the horror of the Anthropocene, the Capitolocene. In then and now, past and future are here, together, in a blurred time ecology. For me, the work supplies the very thing that neo-materialism overlooks, the preponderance of the human and the return of history. For if all matter is equally distributed and the human just an acting like any other, then how do we account for the historic and boric role that capitalism has played in the production of our world. June in Glasgow was hot. The water in the canal was transparent. Dead fish, green carp pike, floated to the surface, their bodies swollen, ready to pop. Green alvi covered the canal. It stunk. When they dug it out, it looked like solidified petroleum. July. High summer, but the rain and cloud have returned. I think of the extraordinary images of the city produced by the photographer Raymond Depardon in the 1980s in a photo shoot for the Sunday Times and then pulled out of circulation because his pictures, in their stylized realism, in their density, 
conflicted too much with the glitzy image of the city promoted by the city council as it geared up for the city of culture extravaganza in 1990. Depardon captures the light magnificently. He is so attuned to it, it's almost as if it blinded him, imprinting himself on its retina, a kind of white eclipse. The first thing that he experienced. I've tried to use the word experience with care here, for we do not see light. Light is a medium that allows us to see other objects. To photograph the light, as Depardon does, is precisely then not to see it, but rather to allow oneself to be affected by it, to remain open to its impress. One then is not so much capturing light as allowing oneself to be captured by it, and to go on to translate that capture into a series of images, moods, psychologies and emotions. On the canal, everything is alive, it's too much, it's verdant. I wonder about what differentiates walking with a dog from walking with people. Of course there are numerous stops to pick up shit and to separate fighting dogs. But what stands out for me are the ways in which I am constantly moving between the earth and the sky. Looking down, looking up, following Mally's movements in the undergrowth and then watching her run towards the horizon. Might this movement, this inhabitation of the interstice, allow for a different thinking of time? Time here percolates and bubbles, it fizzes, it skizzes, it does not flow in some arrow-like movement in the sequential measured temporality so beloved of capitalist modernity. August, a change in the light around mid-month, a new softness, the evening shortening, summer on its way out. Our extant nomenclature of the seasons is too crude. We need other words for grasping the subtle shifts in the, su the, subtle shifts in the weather for calibrating its mood and changes. Raspberries and apples on the canal, some leaves changing color already, foxglove, magenta, lilac, and silver birch trees weaving in the wind. On the canal, there is always rain in the air, even when it's not physically present. Moisture in the atmosphere, you can see it dimpling the water. I notice how few times I've seen the weather coming from the east. Here in Glasgow, everything is pointing towards the west, towards the Atlantic, towards the Americas, hurricanes, the Gulf Stream, great gyres in the ocean. To love the weather is to give in to multiplicity, to realize that everywhere is always elsewhere, to give up on borders. In the extent to which then and now is a meditation on time, it is also a meditation on space, a here and a there. The same caesura, the same forward slash that simultaneously connects and disconnects disparate, even opposed times and spaces. I'm reminded of how we talk about theatre, we often describe the work as a piece. This is an accurate word for an art form that can never be whole, and that always changes its form in its necessary commitment to time. Theatre is the medium closest to weather, a vehicle that transports, an apparatus that is always here and there simultaneously. September. In his important book, Conversation Pieces, Community and Communication in Modern Art, Bram Kester argues for a new methodology for understanding the objectives of certain kinds of community art that place the emphasis on process rather than product. This entails, Kester claims, a new focus on longitudinal inquiry, spending time with the work, seeing how the work was made, and the changes the work affects as it unfolds over time. A different but related argument for duration is made by the art critic T.J. Clarke. In the sight of death, an experiment in art writing, Clark explains how he arrived on a fellowship at the Getty Institute in Los Angeles, not quite knowing what he would do. He soon found himself, however, magnetically attracted to two paintings by Poussin, landscape with a, with a man killed by a snake and landscape with a car, which he proceeded to visit on a daily basis for several months throughout 2000. While I would certainly not put myself in the same august company as Kester, and in particular Clark, my own accidental engagement with then and now is perhaps of a similar order. I was interested in tracing the work's shifting shape, in tracking its transience, in mapping the ways in which sculpture becomes theatrical, that is to say temporal, always moving, committed to change. It quickly became apparent that the work was as much about the weather and me as it was about itself. Then and now was a medium, a host and a catalyst. 
It communicated information. It allowed me to engage with the environment. It produced thought. I've tried to weave this assemblage of experience through this writing. October, the last one, thank God. Somewhere between the electricity pylon at Rock Villa and the then and now engraving in Apple Cross Street, I have the following thought. How long did it take for a place to walk itself into you? Readers conversant with the work of the Sheffield-based theatre company Force Entertainment will recognise the shape of this question, but they will also sense a difference. Where Force Entertainment placed the emphasis on the human agent, how long, they ask, before you can write about place. I'd like to give more attention to the agency of the place itself, to the way that walking the same path again and again weathers you, breaking down your defences, to the point where the place leads its own autonomous life within your cells, psyche and bones. Maybe this is why we feel homesick, so wretched, when we depart a place. Not so much because we, the human beings, have left an environment, but because the place that you carry with you in the landscape, maybe, of your soul, has been transported elsewhere, severed from itself, like an island adrift in the sea. What a strange thought to think that the soul is geographical, simply a place that is migrated from the outside to the inside of a human being and which is reflected with emotion, memory and imagination. My friend M is a refugee from Iran. He's a Kurd. He walks the canal daily, like me. I've never talked to him about then and now. He walks to alleviate the anxiety and depression that threaten to engulf him when he remains trapped within his room, watching television and having no one to talk to. 15th of October. For the past two months, they've been building a new cycle path by Apple Cross Street Bridge. The work is almost finished now. All that is required is to lay some new turf around four of the then now stones. The stones themselves look extraordinary as they sit in a field of brown mud. Like in a Zen garden, they are objects that have retreated mysteriously and massively into their own imminence. And yet, at the same time, they are things that allow the world around them to come into view and to swirl vertiginously in the air. The meeting of opposites, then, stones that radiate a haze of atoms that have become incorporeal. 29th of October. When I started to notice then and now on the canal ten long months ago, in January 2016, I was suffering for the first time in my life from seasonal affective disorder. I was undone, maybe decreated by the sky, abandoned by light. Today is the last Saturday in the month, the day when the clocks go back. The whole day has been like a premonition of winter, a smear on the landscape, thin drizzle, a sky so low and dark that it's like walking in an endless but anonymous night. Even the high-rise blocks in the city melt in the gloom. It hurts my eyes and it makes my bones shiver. I know what's in store. The temptation always is to self-medicate, but maybe the better solution is to just give in, to embrace weakness, and to accept that in winter, the sun is always defeated. Thanks.